Welcome to another episode of Lessons from the Cockpit. I am your host, Mark Hacera, and for over 24 years, I was an Air Force KC-135 pilot. But I'm also a joint warfighter. I have 10 cats and traps on eight aircraft carriers. And I'm the author of the book, Tanker Pilot, Lessons from the Cockpit, where our podcast gets its name. Flying is described as long periods of boredom interrupted by short intermittent periods of extreme terror. On the Lessons from the Cockpit show, we debrief some of the most intriguing and fascinating pilots, aircrew members, maintainers, and general aviation enthusiasts from all over the world. The guests on our show tell the most incredible stories, but more importantly, what did they learn from it? And how did this change them or change the way that they do things in these extraordinary and extreme military, commercial, and private flying operation. This exploration gives our listeners practical advice on how does the aviation world work and expands critical thinking skills and expertise both in the air and on the ground. Many of the stories that you're going to hear on the Lessons from the Cockpit show have never been told before. You are hearing them for the very first time. Today, our sponsor is the book Hogs in the Sand by Buck Wyndham. Who is our guest today? Buck flew A-10s in the first Gulf War, and he's here going to talk about his experiences flying the A-10, the gun that the thing has, and walking up and down the highway of death after the war. So, grab an adult beverage of your choice, sit down, strap in, and let's begin the Lessons from the Cockpit show with Buck Wyndham, hog pilot, in Desert Storm. Buck Wyndham, welcome to the Lessons from the Cockpit show. Great to see you, Mark. Thanks for having me. Really great to be here. Oh, it's great to have you on. And this episode is sponsored by Hogs in the Sand by Buck Wyndham, a great book that all of you need to go out and and buy because you are put in the cockpit with Buck Wyndham and his hog. Well, single seater, so you get you get to virtually ride along. I really wish there had been a two seater to take people along sometimes, but uh, uh, not really. I enjoyed my single seat. That's a very interesting point. Tell everyone what happens when you go through Hog RTU. Well, it's surprisingly straightforward systems classes, a little bit of weapons employment stuff at first. You go out one fine day with your instructor. You climb up in the cockpit. He follows you up, you strap in, he watches you. While he's standing there on the ladder, you start the engines, do your flight control checks, and then he gives you the thumbs up, you shut down, and you go back inside. The next fine day, you go out, and this time, he doesn't follow you out to your airplane, he just goes over to his airplane. And you start up, run through your flight control checks, and you taxi out. And he follows you, do your first takeoff, and he's talking to you the whole time. He's on a FM radio talking to you, saying things like, uh, okay, rotate a little bit more, a little more, a little more. There you go. Hold it. Okay. There's your lift off. There's your positive climb. Go ahead and get your, get your gear up. Okay. You can get your flaps up. And the whole flight is conducted like that. He just follows you around. The plane flies like an airplane. So it's not a huge deal. It it seems like a big deal because first solo being your first flight, but really it flies like an airplane. You can do it. Anybody can do it. uh, Who's a pilot who's graduated from pilot training. The hard part comes later when you start doing all the weapons employment and learning how to use this thing as a weapon. And uh, that's where it becomes a a workload and a a challenge, a good challenge. And it's just a wonderful, wonderful airplane to fly. Took great care of me over my brief time flying it. I miss it dearly. Oh, don't we all, Buck? (laughs) You know that, don't we all? The one thing about the A-10 is that big freaking massive gun. (laughs) Talk to us about the gun a little bit so that our listeners understand what the term brr means. <laughs> well, and that really is going to be its legacy if it ever goes away someday, which, you know, they're, they've been detr- trying to do that for 30, 40 years now. Long but time. The, th- that will be its legacy is that, that sound, uh, that gun. So yeah, the largest forward firing gun in the Air Force inventory. I say forward firing because the AC-130 had a slightly beaten caliber, but that's a sideways firing gun and it's, yeah. it's not a single seat thing that you have between your legs that shoots straight ahead. Yeah, right there. there it is. 105 I see, round. Your, see your 105 round. <laughs> Holy moly. Well, 
The first time you shoot the gun, you know, they tell you what to expect. They say, well, you know, it's going to be a vibration and there's a noise and then uh, have this happen. And you're going to see the, the smoke going out the front. It's going to obscure your view just for a second. And the, the G meter is going to peg up to plus 10 and minus six G's uh, just from the vibration. And so you go, yeah, okay, okay, I got it. And you go out and the first time you do it, you roll down the chute and you squeeze the trigger halfway. And there's a little detent there that would normally start the camera. So you squeeze halfway, you're lining up your pipper, and then you gently, just like any other gun, you gently squeeze the trigger, the idea being to be slightly surprised by the, uh, the firing of the gun. When it happened to me, I was, I don't know what, to, what I was expecting, but the whole plane just started roaring is what I call it. It wasn't a, it wasn't an instant vibration. It was, it was a roar that came from up under the floorboards and into my headset, into my helmet, even though it was, you know, a thick helmet. And I made up a cuss word right on the spot. I won't tell you what it was, but it was, uh, it was a brand new, brand new word. And I uh, pulled off the target. I made about a one, one second burst or so, but then what was unexpected and what, I was not prepared for was the smell. They actually uh, didn't tell me that a couple seconds later, you actually smell the gun gas. The, the I didn't ice. know that. Yeah, it comes up through the uh, through the floorboards into the cockpit. And of course, you're at low altitude. So your oxygen regulator is sort of a mix of oxygen and ambient air. And so you get the smell in your mask a couple seconds later, and it's a wonderful smell. So uh, that was a, <laughs> that was an unexpected benefit to it. The gun is really reliable. It's uh, never jammed on me. I think I had a momentary gun jam light one time, but the, the gun cleared itself. It backed up and fixed whatever problem it was. and was ready to go again seconds later. So it's a, it's a great, great weapon. Awesome. Awesome power. Just amazing. And so. you know what, Buck? They're using that thing a lot in the Gulf. Absolutely. Uh, I, I remember seeing the skull bangers up in Idaho. Idaho, yeah. Had come back, and one of the jets they said had fired something like 309,000 rounds <laughs> in their six month deployment. Wow. And there's That's this amazing. picture of the of one of their jets upside down, and there's just this black streak down the belly yeah. of the jet. Of the I remember seeing that like picture. Going, oh my gosh. You know, <laughs> it's the way it should be. Well, yeah, 309,000 rounds too, you know, because obviously it goes through everything. Yep. And yep. they were using it on the mud huts in, in Afghanistan and just a lot of different targets. And we're going to get into that as, as we talk about what you did during Desert Storm, because as I read in your book, the hog was doing things it wasn't designed to do. <laughs> yes, it was. Yes, it was. We, uh, we branched out a lot. Sometimes they told us to do things and we, we were incredulous to what they were asking us to do. But we did it, sort of expanded our, our reach and our, our roles greatly, uh, which was a surprise. Uh, that worked until it didn't work, which I'll tell you about. You're in England when Saddam invades. Yeah, I was actually physically in Alaska on a, uh, on a one-month uh, TDY mm -hmm. with the Barksdale Reserve Unit. Uh, doing what they call a boar swap. And I was up there just having a good old time flying around Alaska. And Saddam Hussein invaded Kuwait, took it on as his 19th province. And the world said, no, nah, no, this is not going to happen. Uh, you can't you can't just go into another country and, and exit. As you know, as you remember, uh, yeah. Desert Shield started building up forces over there in the Middle East, uh, all over the place, not just in uh, Saudi Arabia, but in all over the Persian Gulf region. Uh, we had Navy and Air Force and Marine and Army everything's supplies rolling the in there. It was, everything's flowing into the region. Everything, everything. And uh, every month there was a new total of uh, people going into the Gulf region. And by the time the war actually started, it was about 570,000 people in theater, which if you think about it, is just, just amazing uh, percentage of our total military population at that time. Uh, my squadron was put on alert, basically, to go. There were already A-10s within within a week or so of the invasion of Kuwait. There were already A-10s headed that direction to es essentially defend Saudi Arabia because it was felt that Saddam was going to keep moving south and move into the oil fields of Saudi Arabia. And we just, you know, we couldn't have that either. So the A-10s were dumped unceremoniously at this base in eastern Saudi Arabia with nothing. They didn't really have any place to stay. They had what weapons they had on the airplane that they had flown over with uh, for the first couple of days. 
it was probably a pretty scary thing for them. My squadron was still back in England. And as the fall went on and this thing went on and on, uh, they were adding squadrons, adding A-10 squadrons. Somewhere in October, we were notified that uh, we were probably going to go. And then in late October, we were told, yes, you are definitely going. And that's when we really shifted into high gear, started doing a lot of training, which brought up an interesting thing, which is that there's nothing to hide behind in the desert. We're used to hiding behind hills, going in at low altitude, popping up, delivering our weapons, and then going back down behind the hills in Germany and, and hiding. Well, you can't do that in the desert. So we started doing high altitude dive bombing tactics. We started learning that and, and getting good at that. So when we finally did deploy on Christmas Eve, we were fairly comfortable that we could do a 45 or 60 degree dive bomb and not kill ourselves. Uh, we got down to the desert the next day, Christmas day. We were basically told, uh, welcome to the club here. There's going to be seven squadrons of A-10s. You're number six. Wow. The last squadron to arrive was the Cajuns from, uh, from New Orleans the 706th Fighter Squadron. Mm -hmm. They joined us. There was um, very little fanfare. It was just like, hey, get get to work, get get set up because the war is probably going to start in about three weeks. And I will hand it to our senior leaders. That war was planned really, really well. It was executed really well, but but they they planned it for, you know, the first new moon of the of the of January so that it was going to be pitch black. Uh, the weather's generally good in Saudi Arabia in the wintertime. So the UN deadline for Saddam to get out of Kuwait was January 15th of 1991. And as you know, the war started on January 17th, gave him a little well. bit of time. <laughs> and um, we, at that point, we had seven A-10 squadrons, about 144 airplanes and about 250 pilots. And we were all based at one place, which was uh, King Fahd International Airport in eastern Saudi Arabia which was a under construction international airport. Uh, it had been under construction for something like eight to 10 years. Uh, <laughs> I guess they work slow, but uh, we took it over, had a giant tent city there and just row after row of, of A-10s in revetments. So it was a, it was a really neat site. And yeah. people don't understand what it takes to build up a base like oh, that, you know? Incredible. And it happened fast too. Really fast, all right? Particularly yeah. when you've got that many airplanes not only do you have to care and feed the people, you got to care and feed the airplanes. You really do. It, and our maintenance guys and uh, all the, the civil engineers and everything have to take a lot of credit for what happened there because, you know, you dump a pilot with his airplane into the middle of a desert. Well, that's great, but he can't do anything with it <laughs> until everybody else arrives and does the real work to get this thing going, can build up the bombs, load the fuel, take care of the airplanes massive, massive undertaking. And the teamwork that everybody went through down there was just, just extraordinary. I was really impressed. You mentioned something just a second ago about the weapons and what it takes, go just explain real quickly what it takes to create an ammunition storage area yeah. in a place like that's never seen ammunition. Yeah. Yeah. You got to keep it separated. Obviously you got to put it away. They put it in, they, they put our bombs in revetments for the most part. So they were open, but they were all separated out from us. And they're different components. Obviously you've got the, you've got the tail fins, you've got the bomb itself. You've got the nose and tail fuses that have to be fitted. It all has to be, to be put together and they don't do it until they, the night before, maybe a couple nights before they'll start building up the next days or two days, two days forward. Uh, bomb loads that they need. So uh, there's, they're always working. They're working all night. You know, we dropped, we dropped a lot of bombs. It's funny in this, in this war, this Gulf, first Gulf war, we didn't shoot the gun as much as say the guys in Afghanistan did. We did at first, but when we started to run into uh, guys getting shot down because we were going low, do it. They sort of restricted our gun use after a while. So overall, we didn't shoot, shoot the gun as much as an A-10 pilot would, would like to shoot the gun. I didn't um, know that. Yeah. Yeah. We, I, I think, um, I think I only squeezed the trigger on perhaps half of my missions. I dropped a lot of bombs and shot a lot of Maverick missiles, but actual gun use was, was somewhat restricted in the last half of the war. Ex yeah. Tell everybody how you were loaded out. Cause that, I found that really fascinating in the book to all of our listeners I'm sure an armor load, an anti-personnel load, all these different things that, that you do, and you kind of have to find the happy medium. Explain to people the weapons load you were carrying 
And more importantly, why did you pick that load? Uh, the first thing you got to remember is that it was hot there. So the performance of the aircraft was was somewhat limited. It was hot, I should say, toward the end of the war. It was getting getting warm. And the A-10, uh, you know, it can handle a load, but it's not really going to perform that well, not going to climb that great. So uh, we started off with a little bit heavier loads and sort of came to that happy medium that you mentioned over time. It was a uh, compromise between how much do we want the airplane to perform and how much stuff that we want to carry. We would normally go out um, after we sort of figured this out, we'd go out with approximately four to six 500 pound Mark 82 dumb bombs. We'd go out with two Maverick missiles, usually one television guided and one infrared guided. We'd go out with two uh, AIM-9 surface to air missiles and we'd have chaff and flare, full chaff and flare dispensers. And then we'd go out with the uh, electronic countermeasures pod, which was always with the airplane. You couldn't couldn't punch that off uh, in an yeah. emergency. That always stayed with you. They didn't want that yeah. getting into the enemy's hands. And a full gun. So uh, 1,175 rounds of uh, 30 millimeter. That's usually our, what we would take. Mm-hmm. And the first order of business was to go out and find a suitable target Usually we'd be assigned a target in one of the kill boxes that they had set up, which were 15 miles by 15 miles. And we would try to get rid of our heavy bombs first. Just get rid of that, those six 500 pound bombs. There's 3000 pounds gone and the jet performs a lot better now. And now you can maneuver around and do what you want with your Maverick and your gun and all that stuff. So that was kind of the order. Um, And generally we didn't get anything really special bombs loaded until we actually had a specific target to go after them uh, after or missiles i should say uh like there's certain types of mavericks that uh um were better for certain targets they might load a bunch of those on maybe four on if you were Mm -hmm. specifically targeted against something that needed that so there was a little variation we'd do some cluster bombs combined effects munitions did quite a quite a few bombs. A lot of those were from the Vietnam era, yeah. and they had a little problem where they would stick together. the The shell was made up of uh, uh, three parts that would separate and let these little bomblets out. And these things were from Vietnam, so they were they were kind of rusty. And I'll never forget the day out on the flight line, uh, seeing a weapons guy standing on top of a stack of cluster bombs with a hammer, a steel hammer, hammering on the bombs to try to loosen them up. <laughs> we were having some failures to open and they wanted to eliminate that. And that was that was their way of doing it. So as you can imagine, we all kind of walked away slowly looking over our shoulder. Yeah. And saw that. Those were the old uh, like uh, Su-30 cans and things like that, weren't they? Uh, yeah, I, I don't remember what the actual with cans the, were with called. the little baseballs in them. Yeah, yeah. CBU 57s is, yeah. is the main one that we dropped. Yeah. Yeah. That we used on SAM sites and things like that during the Vietnam right. War. Right, right. Jeez. You guys rarely carried that triple launcher for the Mavericks, did you? No, we, we had those, but we generally just put two Mavericks on there. Yeah. They found that uh, it was much more reliable that way. They had problems carrying three, and it was also just a big, heavy load. Uh, yeah. so yeah, just two, yeah. two on each high drag really load. <laughs> yeah, very much, very, a lot of drag on three. Yeah. Uh, so as the 15th rolls around, we're rolling into the 17th. Everybody knows we're getting ready to go to war mm-hmm. and you go out and you fly your first mission and just talk about your first mission, you know, at the opening of desert storm. Yeah, we were given a, uh, a predetermined target area, but not a predetermined target. They said, you're going up to the Marine Central area, which was basically Kuwait. Um, I was late taking off because of, me- of a mechanical issue with my airplane. The uh, liquid oxygen was uh, had leaked out overnight for some reason. And so they gave me a spare. So I stepped out to the jet a couple hours late. We headed up to Kuwait. It was now daylight. We were, it's supposed to be taken off pre-dawn, but now it's daylight. So we showed up at the border and made contact with a forward air controller, believe it or not, in an OV-10 Bronco, a Marine guy. And he's out there ahead of us in Kuwait, down at 8,000 feet, circling around. Actually, I think he was at 6,000 feet, circling around. He called us in and said, yeah, not much going on right now. I got a, got, got some targets for you. And we're like, 
okay. We were all hiked up. I mean, I was, here we go crossing the border into bad guy land for the very yeah. first time. Yeah. First day of the war, A-10 has never been in combat before. So we don't, we don't know what's going to happen. We just don't know. And I think that's, that was actually a good thing that we were ignorant about it because, you know, if you think about it too much or if you have too much, too many war stories to listen to before you do it, you get a little nervous, but we were just kind of dumb and, and ready for anything. <laughs> <laughs> Went in there, he fired a couple of Willie Pete rockets, the white phosphorus rockets mm -hmm. at a uh, target that he wanted us to hit, which was an artillery position with a radar van in the center. Uh, we briefed it up. My flight lead goes by Fang in the book, mm -hmm. told me what we were going to do. He was going to go in first and ripple his six bombs across the target. And then I was going to follow him uh, after he climbed back up to altitude. And that's exactly what we did. Uh, he rolled in. I watched his bombs go off and tear up a couple of the... Uh, the artillery units there, yeah. pieces. And then uh, I rolled in and had my first experience with time dilation, uh, where everything slows down and you're able to really focus on every individual second of the bombing pass. This was to happen to me many, many more times during the war. Uh, I really haven't experienced it much since then. So I can only guess that that's what happens when uh, you're greatly under stress but uh, it was to become a, a fixture of my wartime experience was almost every bomb pass was took what felt like hours. So I uh, dropped mine, rippled my bombs across the radar van and across one of the other um, guns, pulled off successfully, didn't get shot at that first time. Shot out a little later in the mission, uh, just some random AAA fire that we saw. Tried to go hit another target with a Navy SEAL on the beach in Kuwait, who was vectoring us in to shoot some missiles at this artillery spotting position got shot at again, just a little bit again, not real close to us, but enough to make us go, Hmm, maybe we better uh, get out of here. So we went home <laughs> two and a half hour mission and uh, landed, kissed the ground. And then we went in debriefed and that's when the crap hit the fan. We, uh, we kind of realized, uh, wow, we are flying. We were down at 6,000 feet. We're rolling in and pickling our bombs at 3,500 feet. We are, we are right in the heart of the threat envelope. We better rethink this. I think a lot of people had that little come to Jesus thing that first day. And we sort of rethought our tactics and moved it up a little bit on day two and, and subsequently. So that was my first uh, mission. It was just one mission on the first day. Later on, we were regularly doing three missions a day. That was kind of our, our thing. We would fly uh, the first mission up to Iraq or Kuwait and then go to our one of our forward operating bases called KKMC, King Khalid Military City refuel, rearm, go fly a second mission, go back to KKMC, third mission, and then back home to King Fahd International Airport. That was our routine. We would fly generally two days out of three. Uh, third day, you'd be working some additional duties, working the ops desk or the mission planning cell or uh, whatever they had you doing. So that was kind of our routine and uh, we settled into it. Things plugged, uh, went along for a number of, um, number of weeks. Uh, the weather was pretty bad. We didn't get a lot done for about a week and a half. Yeah, and then uh, then we started being able to actually do our job. And that's when it got really rewarding, but a little scary too. That's when we started having some losses. So yeah, that that was that was my first that was my first mission. That's kind of what it was like. You know, and I remember mine, the things that I felt, the things that I was thinking, and mm -hmm. you know, I'm just in the tanker, but I'm refueling the first weasel package going into Baghdad. So it's a really important refueling mission tight timing. Matter of fact, I just interviewed the mission commander that I was refueling on Tuesday. It was just hmm. fascinating to hear him feeling kind of the same emotions. And, and, and it's interesting how your first combat mission affects people different ways. Mm -hmm. My co-pilot goes, cool. My <laughs> navigator was very emotional. Mm -hmm. My boom operator didn't say a word. Hmm. I said, starts tonight. And they just, and, and that's what, that's how they reacted. What was it, your reaction? Just, my reaction was, please don't let me screw up. <laughs> you know that? Well, you got that right. Don't let me screw this up. I've been a religious man my entire life. You know, member of the LDS church, mm -hmm. obviously spent a little time on my knees, you know, protect me tonight, protect my crew, protect all of us. As we got closer to the border, the MIGs reacted. Task Force Normandy was doing its thing. The helicopters attacking that one EWGCI site. And things just went crazy after that mm. with MIG calls over the radio and everything. Uh, but we kept pushing forward. 
his number four guy wasn't getting gas. Hmm. It wasn't going into his tanks. And so we got to the NDR point. And I just said, we're going to keep pushing. And we dropped him off just a couple miles from their fence checkpoint. But that's what we were supposed to do. And I remember very distinctly, Buck, saying, watching these guys all pass underneath us now heading north, saying to my crew, we got to get home. This is going to be on CNN. <laughs> right. And we, we beat feet for home. It was kind of a euphoric feeling when mm. you, even on the way home, we saw all these red rotating beacons going the other way, mm. which was an incredible sight. And we're heading the opposite direction. I remember this euphoric feeling of, man, we survived. Mm -hmm. We're here. We lived through this. And it was, well, shoot, if I can live through that, I can live through any other mission after that. Yep. Isn't it interesting how people, even though they respond in different ways, it seems that everybody who experiences combat gets uh, gets religion. I don't want to, I don't know if, you know, nobody gets converted maybe, but, but everybody sort of faces the existential nature of, yeah. of their life. And, and uh, you know, what's the old saying there? There, yeah. yeah, there there are no atheists in foxholes. I guess is the old saying. Yeah, that's that's really true. I mean, everybody, even the even the most uh, you know uninterested in religion guy in my squadron was talking about. Wow, I got down and kind of went like looked up at the heavens when I got home and said thanks. <laughs> uh, yeah, oh, very yeah. interesting. The crazy thing that happened was, of course, we get back to our hooch and we're watching CNN. The guy that I interviewed Tuesday was the mission commander shows up on CNN. <laughs> okay. His wing commander. And he tells this story was going to make him like the media guy. And mm -hmm. so he's explaining what's going on and he still has the mask thing around his face, <laughs> the mask imprint around his face. And, and he's talking about went in big light show, all these different things. And my boom operator comes into the living room and goes, Hey, the phone calls for you. And I thought, okay, well, you know, it's, what we're going to do tonight, our next mission or anything like that. And he goes, no, it's your dad. Mm. And I go, excuse me. It's your dad on the phone. Mm. And I go and I pick up the phone and I go, you know, Captain Nacera, may I help you, sir, ma'am? You know, you never go out of that military mode. And sure enough, it's my dad. Hey Holy son, God. how you doing? Mm. You know, Valerie, my wife gave me your phone number. I just thought I'd call, see how you're feeling, how you're doing. I said, oh, dad, I wish I could talk to you about some of the things that we just we just experienced last night. Yeah. You know, after the war, I'll do that. My dad and I were really tight, really, mm. really tight. I, I love my mom to death, but I always went to my dad when I had things I wanted to talk about. Wow. And, and that was a great thing that happened to me after my first mission. Our mission was intense because we had MiG calls in front of us. Medicis Airfield oh, right yeah. in front of us goes active with MiG-29s flying out of it. There's that famous video from the F-111 that shows the MiG going down the runway, yeah. the fulcrum going down the runway, and then the bomb hitting like right behind him. The gorillas, the the uh, F-15 guys, take a bunch of those guys out. I mean, it was really an intense mission. Hmm. And it was just good to hear my dad's voice. It was very calming. And you know yeah. what? By my fourth or fifth mission, it became routine. I don't mean to say that I let my guard down. It was just now mm -hmm. I know what to expect. Yep. I wasn't scared. I wasn't frightened at all. I had some frightening things happen to us, but we handled it. I'm sure you guys went through the same thing. After we your did. first mission, you fly a couple of missions and you're like going, okay, I can do this now. I was far more scared uh, on my uh, third, fourth, fifth missions than I was on my first couple. I think it was just ignorance on the first mission. I didn't know what to expect. So I was completely open to yeah. anything when I started to think about it and uh, realize what this was going to be like for the next, who knows how long, uh, that's when I started to, to lose a little bit of sleep, uh, to get a twitch in my eyelid and some other things, you know, we, we had certain guys in my squadron who were affected more than others. Everybody had different, different things they went through, but, uh, I started having nightmares. That was the big thing I had. And, uh, that was an indication that my brain was trying to get rid of some dark gooey things at night. And that lasted for a few weeks. And then one day I just suddenly came back from a mission. I realized I had not been scared the whole mission. I felt confident. I felt good about what I was doing. I was not afraid to die. I was, uh, 
I was at one with my airplane and my mission. And I, I just pressed on from there and it, it only got better toward the end. I actually, I almost had like a religious experience my last week of the war because I was just so happy to be there. I almost went the other way. I almost became, became kind of a, I don't want to say a warmonger, but I, I became, I got bloodlust and I was really enjoying what I was doing. And um, so, yeah. And we're going to talk about that here in a little bit too, because you basically got, you got to go to Kuwait city and we'll, we'll discuss that here in a minute. Mm. I wanted to bring something else up because you had talked in your book, you talked about some of those nasty dreams. I was surprised at the detail that you could remember those. You also had someone there to kind of help you (laughs) get through it. And her name is Sarah. Sarah. Sarah was our assistant maintenance officer. She and I had been friends for about a year. She was back in England. She had shown up in the O Club one night and I said, wow, and went over and introduced myself. And and we gradually became friends. We lived right near each other in England and uh, we'd hang out on the weekends and do things and have dinner together and stuff. And I thought, hey, this is great. We're going to get deployed to the desert together. I'm going to have her all to myself down there. She had a boyfriend uh, back in the States, allegedly. And uh, I thought, well, that's, that's no issue. I'm gonna, <laughs> I got her right here. I'm taking yeah. her to the desert. And yeah, we went down there together and I chased her around for the whole time we were down there. We hung out as much as we could there in the, in the desert, which was not easy. It's you know, a busy base with no privacy and no, uh, you know, just lots of people, lots of things going on, plus the nerves and the, uh, the war going on. That's not easy to be a be a good suitor, if you will. I, I really struggled with ways to <laughs> to do that yeah. as I was going through my own demons at the time. But she was very helpful to me. She kept my mind sort of focused on other things away from the war at times. And, and that was great. I really enjoyed her company there. And I don't know how it would have been without her, without her there. Very unique. Nobody else had a girlfriend, if you will, or a significant other or somebody they were chasing. Everybody else's wives or girlfriend were back home in England. I felt very lucky to to have the my interests, my love interests right there with me. So and that was good. People don't understand what kind of fantastic support that is just when you see that person's face. Yes. And sometimes yes. all it takes is you may be on opposite ends of the chow hall and you'll look at each other and mm. all of a sudden there is a, I don't know how to say this, a calm and a peace that comes over you as mm-hmm. you both look at each other and just smile. Huh? Yep. Yep. And that's uh, kind of achieved by the only other way we could do it. Like with your dad calling up, uh, uh, we had a phone tent. It was very important for everybody to, you know, make their weekly calls home if they could, even if it was for just five minutes and, and connect, you know, you hang around the guys in the squadron and you know them, but they're not, they're going through their own demons. You know, they're not going to be your necessarily your, your deep psychological support network. They're dealing with things. Everybody's expected to be doing their jobs. They're great friends are great buddies and I'd do anything for them, but I don't know that I could tell any of them that I was having nightmares. <laughs> yeah. And probably didn't want to No, you know, particularly because no. during this whole time period, the one person we feared on base was the flight surgeon. <laughs> yes. I'll just say it up front. Okay. <laughs> that you hasn't know. changed. <laughs> yeah. That hasn't changed, you know, in combat, the one person you fear the, the, the one person that is your best friend, but the one person you fear at the same time is yep. the flight surgeon. <laughs> yeah. Right. Hold because, your career over his Yeah. Head. Yeah. Because, those, you know, how are you doing? You know, what are you taking? Are you getting enough sleep? You know, asking all these kind of personal questions. Because I was kind of having some of the same kind of things in the middle of the night. I'd have some of these, you know, crazy mixed up dreams that I'd wake up and, mm. and you'd be awake for like an hour. And then finally, you know, your alarm would go off and you go, well, Jeez, I got four hours of sleep tonight. And that was the last thing you wanted the flight surgeon to hear. You know, absolutely. We had guard and reserve uh, units at Jetta. So we had some doctors that were very knowledgeable, had been flight surgeons for a long period of time, and they were great, great people. You know, I can remember one conversation with them saying, you know, how are you doing? You get enough sleep, all that kind of stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah, doc. I'm doing good. I'm doing good, doc. You know, and then just kind of keep moving. <laughs> the A-10 during this time period begins doing a lot of missions it really isn't designed to do. And there's one of them I want to talk to you about specifically, and that was the Great Scud Hunt. Yes. Saddam Hussein began launching Scud missiles uh, from two different locations in Iraq. The Western 
area where he was launching them. He was launching them toward Tel Aviv, and um, and that was really upsetting the the Israelis. Of course, they were getting a Scud missile every night. That was starting to really piss them off. He was also launching from the eastern part of the theater at us down in the eastern part of Saudi Arabia. So every night, right around ten fifteen, as it as it happened, they would launch at least a couple of Scuds our way. So we would have alarm red sirens going off every every night and, and a lot of times during the day, too, with in, inbound Scud missiles. And those are nasty things that you know weren't really accurate. So you never know where they're going to hit. So you're always wondering, geez, I wonder where this thing's going to land. So out in western uh, Saudi or out in western Iraq, I should say, were these mobile launchers that were launching these Scuds at Israel. It was imperative that Israel not enter the war. It was felt that that was going to dissolve our coalition, going to piss off all our Arab um, partners in this war. And so the president and the State Department, everything decided we got to stop this, these Scud launches. Among other things, they sent out A-10s. They sent a little contingent of six A-10s at a time out to a little air base in Western Saudi Arabia called Al Jof. We call it Al Juf, but the Saudis call it Al Jof. And it's a a single runway, long runway, uh, municipal airport out there. We took it over, made it a base. And that was the home of the special operators. The uh, SAS, British SAS were out there, uh, as well as a bunch of Army guys, U.S. Army guys. And the A-10s, there were some interesting helicopters out there. And uh, basically, that is where the Scud hunt was conducted from. Uh, our A-10s were on call. We would launch every day and go up there and try to find scuds. That was our primary mission, just just hunting scuds. And we had 55,000 square miles of area, very unencumbered by a lot of the rules of combat, not rules of combat, but the rules of the airspace and yeah. communications and all that stuff that were going on in the eastern part of the theater. So it was like a big turkey shoot free for all kind of thing. It was a it was an A-10 <laughs> hog driver's dream out there. And um, we would go out and just at hunt and occasionally we get a call from one of the special ops teams and they'd say, hey, we got a truck moving up the road here toward us and we don't like it. Can you take it out? And we go and take it out or we sure. would find something. <laughs> sure, we'll do that for you. No problem. Uh, one day, a uh, guy was flying around. And he saw this big compound of buildings three miles long by one mile wide. And it was all these steel tin roof buildings. And he called up the AWACS guys and the battle commanders and said, hey, we've got these buildings out here. Uh, what do you think? And they said, why don't you lob a Maverick missile into one of them and see what happens? <laughs> well, he did. And it proceeded to blow up for days. I mean, it was just loaded with ammunition. It was just like a, a fireworks factory going off. Oh my gosh. That was something that we we figured, well, that this place has everything. We'll call it Home Depot. So that was called <laughs> Home Depot. And every day, every mission, we would try to stop by Home Depot and blow some stuff up. Later in the in the war, another guy whose last name was Hicks, he found a place that we called Hicksville, which was a similar place, but even bigger. And that was, I got to hit Hicksville a couple of times. And that was probably some of the more rewarding bombing that I, <laughs> that I ever did. Instant Just gratification. Instant gratification. <laughs> Absolutely. There was another place called the Villas, which was similar, but it was steel containers on the ground. And each one had all kinds of missiles and rockets and bombs and ammunition of various kinds. So, so yeah, there were a lot of neat things out there in the desert. A lot of, um, we shot at things that we thought were scuds. They could have been frog missiles. They might have been, some of them might have been dummies. Uh, there's some contention now as to whether we hit any scuds out there, but we certainly hit things that blew up. So we found out years and years later that a lot of those storage areas were Saddam's cache of weapons for if he ever had to go and, and fight Israel. That was his munitions for an Israel war. So I think we did some good things out there. And it was very rewarding, a little bit lower threat than on the east part of the, the war. And uh, that's how I finished up the war was was doing that. Um, I learned a lot about being a fighter pilot out there, you know, being single seat. I know uh, the, the crew, the crew environment is its own dynamic and it works really well. There's everybody has a role. Everybody does things uh, that they're trained to do or that they have to do under the circumstances. There are there's a there's a cohesion, a, a, um, a teamwork kind of vibe that, that comes out from your cockpit as a tanker pilot. In the A-10, of course, we're single seat always. There are no two-seaters. So we develop all of those same roles, aircraft commander, pilot, navigator, 
bombardier, radio operator, everything is in one brain. And so we develop we developed a lot of self-protection mechanisms that help us survive. And one of those is kind of an interesting thing that I'll mention, which is kind of the, the third observer kind of concept. It's the person that sits on your shoulder or outside of your, your brain and, and watches what's going on and monitors and sort of every once in a while looks at you and says, dude, <laughs> dude, what are you doing? And uh, that's kind of something that a single seat pilot has to develop or anybody who's flying solo has to develop for themselves. They have to develop a self-monitoring capability and do things for the right reason. Nobody in a single seat airplane or when you're flying solo in any airplane, nobody outside the airplane knows what you're doing precisely. They don't know how well you're running the checklists. They don't know how effectively you're running things. Only you know that. That's one of those things that in an, in an A-10, you, you have to develop early and it sticks, sticks with you for life. No matter what you're flying after that, there's always that really strong ability to self-regulate and monitor. Uh, great lesson learned, <laughs> you know, because- The other one for single seat might be called just fly the airplane. Keep flying the airplane fly no matter what. Aviate, you know, navigate, and communicate. <laughs> yeah. And who else is going to do it? You're by yourself. And I could tell you all kinds of stories about fly the jet. I have one in mind, actually, if, you, if you'd like to hear it. Go uh, right ahead, brother. Okay. I was, I was actually, it's back in England. Uh, this is kind of a weird slash funny story about fly the jet. I was taking a check ride in England. And of course, my examiner was in another airplane. We're, we're in thick, bumpy, wet English clouds, and uh, we're doing an ASLAR approach. And ASLAR means aircraft surge, launch, and recovery. It's an approach that gives us a way to greatly reduce the, the separation uh, between aircraft in, in IFR conditions. And we would fly the initial part of the approach in formation, at a fairly high speed. And then at a predetermined, uh, predetermined point, about eight miles from the runway, the lead would transmit, he'd transmit the word drag over the radio. And the wingman would put his speed brakes out uh, slow down below gear speed, configure, and then s- slow down to his final approach speed. And the leader would do all the same things except a mile or so later. So now you've got this separation of about 6,000 feet. And you could touch down on the same runway about 6,000 feet apart. So on this particular day, the weather for my check ride was, well, it stunk <laughs> at our home base. Typical and English weather, as they typical say. Typical English weather. Yeah, for the first week I, or first two weeks I lived in England, it was beautiful blue skies. And I thought, this isn't bad over here. And then, then I never saw the sun again for three years. So, so here I am flying this thing and, and the approach went fine. And, and I, we got to the drag point. I glanced over at, at my examiner's airplane. I gave the drag command on the radio. And my examiner, instead of extending his speed brakes, he put the gear down instead, which we were about 40 knots over gear speed. Oh, no. uh, so I watched him immediately disappear to the, murky clouds behind me. And he was cussing like a sailor on the FM radio uh, that we use between airplanes. Mm -hmm. Uh, As it turns out, he was not only cussing because of his gear error, but he'd also discovered that his primary attitude indicator had uh, just rolled over and died. So now he's got this big deceleration going, which is disorienting enough, even on a good day. And now he got a huge case of spatial disorientation so now it, it basically almost made him lose control of the airplane from what I, what I found out later. He managed to transition to his little tiny uh, standby attitude indicator, but he's yelling about how he didn't know if it was right or not. I looked down and I was actually seeing a little discrepancy between my standby and my ADI or attitude yeah. indicator. Not as bad as his, but I was still feeling uh, quite a bit of spatial disorientation. So I decided to have us break off the approach and climb back above the clouds, rejoin so we could check out his gear and so give us a chance to sort of get sorted out and figure out if our attitude indicators were messed up or what. And then maybe lead him back to a formation landing or something like that. So we didn't have radar in our airplanes. ATC was, they wanted to know precisely what we were going to do, uh, which we couldn't exactly answer yet. And so it was a real big pain for me to coordinate all this on the fly and, and not knowing you know, how we're going to do it. It was a goat rope of all goat ropes. Yep. I had to forcibly tell ATC what we were going to do and they were not happy about it. Uh, I had to get us up out of the weather. I wanted to go straight ahead quickly and they wanted us to do a bunch of turns and intermediate level offs and all this stuff, but I didn't want to risk 
that had screwed Neither up your head even more. Yeah. So, so we just made it happen. We just forcibly made it happen. We used our air to air tack ends. We got back together on top. His gear was fine. And we figured out that my primary ADI was, was okay. And his was definitely toast. You know, we both safely got on the ground with a formation landing. I let him in and it worked out fine. But and of course, needless to say, I passed that check ride, which <laughs> how could I not, right? But, you know, both of us had some challenges that day. We both of us had some mechanical issues. We had some physiological or uh, spatial orientation uh, issues. He had his overspeed. He was pissed off and discombobulated. And I was too, but we kept flying our airplanes and we kept leaning forward in the saddle uh, to make things happen. And, and of course, you know, when you're flying by yourself, Sometimes you have to be aggressive with your decision-making and you have to take charge of things regardless of what your controller wants you to do. Sometimes you have to save your own life because yeah. you're the one who really knows what you need. That was a big lesson in early on in, in the single seat concept. And it stuck with me and I used it many, many times during my, my time, not only in the A-10, but, but all other airplanes too. Yeah. So. You said something really important here, Buck, too, is you kind of push the reset button. Mm -hmm. You got back together above the clouds, got your heads back. I cannot explain to people what it's like when you have spatial disorientation. Mm. I've had it a couple times. I had it in a T-38 uh, flying on a wing of another airplane, right? And I came down through the clouds and we came down in a 30 degree bank turn and we leveled out, we're still in the clouds. And my head thought we were still in a 30 left bank. Mm -hmm. And I will never, fortunately I had an instructor in the back seat, a really good one too. And I told him, I says, I said, Hey, Lieutenant Fouché, my head screwed up. I'm mm -hmm. leaning about 30, 40 degrees left. He goes, okay, dude, follow your instruments. Look at your wing, you know, look at lead, all those things, you know, that is an experience that none of us ever forget when we have that, is it? It really Partic isn't. Particularly the first time. It, and the crazy thing was, Buck, as soon as we broke out of the clouds and I could see the ground, boom, it was gone. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean, in a <laughs> second, in a nanosecond, boom, it was gone. All I had to do is see the ground. Yep. But for those, I don't know, 20, 30 seconds we were in the clouds, I could have swore that the airplane was in 30 degrees of bank. Oh, yeah. I was looking down at the instruments. I had a great instructor in T-38s, Marcus Carlton. Man, I wish I could find this guy. Mm. He had the five commandments of flying. Rule number one, fly the jet, which you just talked about. Rule number two, instruments are your friend. Mm -hmm. Rule number three, trim is like breathing. <laughs> All right. Rule number four, radio calls do not generate lift. <laughs> which was really closely tied to number five above all else sound cool on the radio. There you go. There you <laughs> okay. go. Those were his five commandments. He had them <laughs> on a sign behind it. Oh, I love it. And he would lean back in his chair, turn in his chair. He says, okay, which one did you violate today? You know, and normally it was fly the jet, but every once in a while it was radio calls don't generate lift. But you know, I'll never forget that fly the jet and being that screwed up in the head. Yep, it's, and thinking to myself, okay, trust your instruments. And like you said, hit that reset button, go to a place that everything's familiar, get your head caged, and then you dive back in again. Yep. Yep. Great life lesson learned there. All right. It is. It is. <clears throat> I, uh, I had an instructor with similar um, rules, but I, I didn't actually write his down. I've sort of come up with my own over the years, but uh, his, his were something like that, but he did have one that was a little bit controversial. I remember and it was something like play by the rules, but be prepared to break them. I, I mean, I get the, I get it. There are times yeah. when to a UPT or a, a training environment, I think that was thought of as a little bit radical. And uh, yeah, so yeah. we didn't, we didn't talk about that one much. Well, let's talk about some of the radical things you got <laughs> to do in the hog, because I remember seeing close air support, seed deed, uh, battlefield air interdiction, all of these things lined up behind the hog and, uh, talk about yeah. that for just a minute that this was really a war where you guys were doing things that this airplane was not designed to do. Yeah. We started off just doing our normal, 
uh, close. We were, we really weren't going to do close air support for a while because this was an air war for the first five weeks. We knew it was just going to be us going in there every day. The army was just holding back most of them, holding back uh, until the ground war started. So so we didn't do close air support. We were doing you know bombing right along the border at first. That worked out well. We're going 10, 15 miles deep, maybe. That was okay. So we started to go 25 miles deep. They started tasking us against some deeper and deeper targets. And then we started going against the Republican guards, which were the really well-trained and well-equipped Iraqi guys uh, that were 60 miles deep. And we started doing that. And uh, that was a surprise. We, (laughs) We made it work. Uh, then they started sending us against things like SAM sites for gosh sakes. Now we're doing wild weasels type stuff. Yeah. So after a while we started, uh, let's see, we, we carried cargo. We actually carried mail from one of our forward operating bases during combat missions. We had mail stuffed into the inside of our airplane oh. and some of the panels. Oh, geez. We did reconnaissance missions. We were, observers, observation tasks that they had us doing. Of course, this wild weasel crazy stuff they had us doing. Eventually, we started talking about the A-10 as the C-R-F-O-A-10-G. <laughs> so, <laughs> cargo, reconnaissance. Little, uh, once we had our, our first air-to-air kill, we added the F for fighter. So yeah, C-R-F-O-A-10-G was what we ended up with. Uh, we had two air-to-air kills uh, there. Uh, that was uh, both of them were helicopters, and uh, uh, Bob Swain shot down the first one. And then yep. a few weeks later, a buddy in my squadron, uh, Todd Shihai, Shanghai, uh, shot one down. I call him Yogi in the book. Everybody in the, in my book had the had their names changed <laughs> to protect the innocent from a yep. lot of things. Yeah, yeah, we were we were doing all these things successfully, and and like I alluded to before. It all worked really well until it didn't. And at some point we reached uh, a place in our operations where we were doing such outrageous things. We were hundreds, in, you know, out West, in the case of uh, out in the Western part of Saudi, we were, or uh, of Iraq, we were literally 165 to 170 miles deep, you know, 45 minutes flying time deep in enemy territory with no place to go but South to get to friendly, uh, land. So yeah, it, it, yeah. that's, that's pretty dramatic. And then we were in areas where, you know, the Iraqis had their really well-trained guys uh, shooting things at us, the, the finest Soviet equipment that they, that they had, they were the fourth largest standing army trained by the Russians. And a lot of the times they didn't shoot stuff very effectively, but then all of a sudden on, on one particular day, and we lost a few guys here and there to stray rounds and things and, and Sam's, but on the 15th of February, uh, suddenly, I guess the Iraqis got the word to just barrage fire SAMs and AAA at us. I don't know what made them change their tactics, but it was uh, it was scary for us and it was effective. And uh, I was sent out with my flight lead to a kill box that was up near the Republican Guard. It was way north. We arrived at the box and the forward air controller who was there in an OA-10 said, hey, guys, I've already got a couple of couple guys here. Why don't you move a couple kill boxes over to the east? Okay. We left, went over to the east, north of Kuwait City, and did our thing. And got I got my butt handed to me uh, by just barrage fire, air to air, or uh, sorry, triple A. Uh, oh surface gosh. to air missiles were not involved in this mission. I had some in another mission, but this was all triple A, any, air, any aircraft artillery. Had just a horrible, horrible day. Probably one of the worst missions I've well, definitely the worst mission I've ever had. I, I basically said, I'm dead. I am dead. I'm not coming home today. This is this is how it ends. Kind of went into the time, slow time dilation mode. And yeah. my whole life was sort of flashing before my eyes. Managed to get out of there and and get home only to find that two A-10s were, were missing. And they were the A-10s that were in our kill box that we had been assigned to go to. They arrived just minutes before us and both of them were lost. That was that was sweet and store. That was mm-hmm. those two guys Enfield flight um, yeah. where one of them got shot down and the flight lead went back. Rob Sweet went back, tried to mark the location and coordinate for a rescue and all that stuff. And then he got shot down. So both of them were lost. One of them POW, the other was killed in action. So that was my little holy cow. We actually our our squadron leadership had actually had a meeting uh, about me and my flight lead 
to address the possibility that it was us because we were assigned that kill box. Yeah. They didn't know that it wasn't us until we landed or until we called in. So it was a holy cow moment. And uh, one I will never forget. And those guys are, you know, they're my heroes because they, they paid a big, big price yeah. for it, um, for what I almost had to do. And I'm glad it wasn't, I'm glad it wasn't me, but I, I, I also know that it could have been me very, very easily. So uh, Rob Sweet and um, uh, Steve Phyllis, Steve Phyllis was the one that was shot down. Uh, Rob Sweet was the one that was POW. Yeah. Uh, Rob Sweet is still with us. He, he became a very high time A-10 pilot and he, uh, he's still out there. He just, just retired, I believe a year ago or so. So uh, Excellent. If you go to uh, Myrtle Beach uh, Airport, which used to be Myrtle Beach Air Force Base. There is a uh, there is a Phyllis Phyllis Street there, and that is named after Steve Phyllis. Yeah. So that's his legacy there, one of his legacies. And he was a great A ten pilot. He was. He was. He was one of those guys in your community that uh, very very well respected. I know yes. he was a weapon high school time guy. guy. A weapon school guy. High time. Yep. Yeah, high time guy and. He was one of the, for lack of a better term, aces of your community. And it was yeah. a big loss when definitely when SIF went down. One of the other guys, you know, that went down was Dale Store. He was the first one we lost and he went in and nobody saw his, they just saw his airplane go into the desert. There was no parachute, no beacon, no, no, nothing. So we assumed he was gone. Um, we didn't, in fact, his squadron had a memorial service for him. We all gave him up for dead. And then uh, four days after the war ended, we're sitting there watching CNN, which was the only channel we could get on our little satellite. There's a bus in Baghdad. There he is. He's wearing this big orange jumpsuit. And it was like he came back from the dead. It was the most incredible thing. Wow. I've had experience with that in my life. I have an uncle that got shot down his first mission over Vietnam Mm. in 1965. And they, his wingman said, there's no way he, he, he lived. Mm-hmm. Airplane blown in half and uh, and went in uh, down low and and my aunt got a letter from him from Hanoi Hilton in wow. 1969. Four years later, that's how oh we my found gosh. out he was alive. Wow. That's how we found out he was alive. Mm-hmm. So I understand what that's like. You know, all of a sudden you see a guy on a bus, you go, "Oh my gosh!" You know, yeah. Because I remember we stayed up late that night, watched my uncle get off the bus at at uh, Travis Air Force mm-hmm. Base. And, mm-hmm. And there he was, my mom, Boy. man, it's my mom's younger brother. And she let out this big scream seeing him on <laughs> TV. And he was there for seven years. Oh, my gosh. Seven years. Yeah. <sighs> Can't even imagine. Our, yeah. our guys were in captivity for, you know, three weeks. Yeah. They were p- treated really poorly. But yeah. I can't imagine what must have been going through their heads because this was the first war we'd had since Vietnam. And the only thing they had to compare it with was in fact, those guys that stayed for seven years at the Hanoi Hilton. Yeah. So were they in the prison that got hit by one of our bombs? Some of them were. Yeah. I believe, I believe uh, Rob Sweet uh, actually tells a story about how place got bombed on his last day or two there. And uh, that's how they knew that things were going to change soon because yeah. <laughs> the whole wall was, the whole place was coming down that's around right. him. That's right. And he's got uh, this big hole in his wall, but he doesn't leave because yeah. he's, he's in downtown Baghdad. Yeah, <laughs> I, I remember that story. Yeah. I remember that story. So that's incredible. You fly all kinds of missions during the war and obviously the war kind of starts winding down and, you know, toward the end, we have the big highway of death. Mm-hmm. And you happen to be one of those guys who got to go to Kuwait City you give a great, great rendition of this in your book, but for my listeners who don't have your book yet, why don't you give us a little background on what happened, who you were with, and mm-hmm. what you saw on your excursion into Kuwait City? They told us the night before, they said, hey, we got a, another little trip tomorrow. They'd been doing these for a couple of days. We were escorted by some army guys. They said, anybody want to go up to Kuwait? I said, yeah. Yeah. I'd love to go up to Kuwait. Shoot. So uh, it was about uh, six or seven pilots, two or three uh, maintenance slash weapons guys. I'm not sure. And then um, we had an army liaison officer, our squadron army liaison officer took us up there along with a couple of other army guys that he knew. And they were kind of, you know, they're escorting a bunch of fighter pilots up into a war zone with all kinds of munitions laying around. So of course they had to babysit us on the way up there. They gave us this briefing that said, don't touch anything. Don't take anything. Stay in our footsteps. Don't be wandering out in the desert. There's all kinds of stuff out there. So we did. 
we humbly accepted that they were the experts in this kind of thing. We got in our Chevy Suburban and we drove north and we headed up uh, across the border from Saudi into Kuwait. And we visited a couple of air bases there, which were amazing because they had been just obliterated by by coalition bombs. You know, a bunch of I-2000s dropped uh, into these hardened aircraft shelters and blowing up whatever was inside. These huge multi-ton doors, concrete doors blown off these shelters and blown a couple hundred feet across the ramp. That Everything must have inside been amazing incinerated. to see, Oh, yeah. Mark. It's just the power yeah. of our air, air power is just amazing. Well, and, and remember, Horner is showing all of these bomb drops every night, okay? It's cool to see the video of the F-111s and the bombs hitting the thing and everything like that. But you got to see the effects up close and personal. Yeah. All right? And you talk about this in your book, going into one of the hard enough aircraft shelters. Talk about that for just a second and what you saw. Yeah, well, we went into several where there were wreckage, there was wreckage of airplanes, but we we came across this this one shelter that honestly it it looked like like um something from a Michael Bay film where the biggest explosion <laughs> ever. Apparently this this bomb had gone in to this hardened aircraft shelter through six feet of concrete and and reinforced you know concrete and ignited a cache of ammunition that was inside of this place. So we went into this hardened aircraft shelter, which I can't really say we went in it. We went into the rubble of it and we walked down into a crater, a smoking crater, still smoking. We were 20 feet below ground level looking at this rubble and the blast fragments went out a quarter mile from this thing. The people that saw it when they were flying over it said it was just blowing up for for days. That was the first thing that I saw that was that was the holy cow moment. Uh, then we started going around and noticing the precision of the bombs that had gone through these hardened aircraft shelters. There was nothing else hit except these hardened aircraft shelters. You know, everything else was fine. The taxiways were fine. The the Brits tended to to destroy the runways with their little uh, anti runway munitions that they had. Two thirty threes, exactly the two thirty threes, and those do a really great job. You know, you think about well, how are you going to close a runway? Well, you just put a bunch of craters. You just break up the concrete. That's all you really have to do. And boy, those things did a great job. Yeah. Um, so yeah, the the effects of this precision bombing it was it was new. It was something we knew. We were in the Air Force. We knew what bombs can do. We knew what precision guided munitions can do. But here you are looking at it, going, yeah. "Wow, yeah." <laughs> the rest of the world in the windows. Know. The rest of the world certainly didn't know. And you're getting no. to see this for the first time. So yeah, then we then we kept driving, and uh, our army guy said, uh, "Yeah, we're coming up on the highway of death." We vaguely knew what that was. We'd heard about the the final day of the war, the F-18s and the Hornets. I mean, sorry, the uh, the Harriers and the A-10s and some F-16s were involved, and uh, even some helicopters were involved. Everybody had shown up to this turkey shoot, which was the retreating Iraqi forces going from Kuwait City back to Baghdad with a whole bunch of stolen booty. They had decided that, okay, this is just about over. This war is, we, we're getting out of here. Let's just grab anything of value that we can grab. So they looted every store in Kuwait City. They took stereo equipment. They took clothing, furniture, the vehicles themselves. They Whatever they could get their hands on, whether it was a car that they hot wired or whether it was a tank, they just started driving north in this big convoy. A couple of Hornet guys put the first bombs in the beginning and the end of this big group of vehicles right at a narrow pass in these two little hills where once you stop the first guy, there's no getting around him. And you really can't drive out in the sand because you're going to get stuck, which a lot of people did uh, when the bombs started going off. And then they got on the radio and said, hey, we got these vehicles. Anybody that wants to participate better get up here to these coordinates. It's like a hog pilot's dream. (laughs) Well, I'll tell you, it was really lucky that we didn't have a midair that night. From what I understand, just everybody was going in there, just launching stuff. It ended up being just a, the most devastating, awful scene that you can imagine. Uh, We came up driving up this highway, just a normal highway. And all of a sudden we came around a corner and there is a corridor of death. There are thousands of vehicles scattered not along the road, but also out into the sand. They're blown up. They're upside down. They run up on top of each other. And uh, we just, we drove up through it. 
I guess the Army Corps of Engineers had been in there with a bulldozer and just made a, a single lane up through the center of it. So we drove up through the center. We got up to a little area where we could pull off. And then we just got out and we just, Army guys said, don't pick up anything. Just, you know, be back here in an hour. And uh, and your first impulse is to pick something up. <laughs> of course. Yeah, there's all kinds of stuff that would make a great souvenir. But, you know, you don't know what's really live. You know, they had a lot of yeah. ammunition with them. Uh, there's there's funny looking things you can't identify. There's personal art, uh, personal uh, effects all over the place. Suitcases full of clothes. There's, you know, there's kids toys. There's brand new wrapped electronics stuff all over the place oh. that they had been stealing. Uh, and so, yeah, then I, I went around a corner and I was face to face with my first Iraqi, uh, except he was only half an Iraqi. He had been sort of burned into the into the pavement, I sort of recognized the, the lower legs and then this sort of burned area. Oh. And uh, so I did an about face, oh. got out of there. And oh. then, uh, uh, you know, walking around, just looking at all of this just destroyed stuff. You know, our army liaison guy is all one of these gung-ho <laughs> army types. He jumps up on a tank and he's looking in the hatch. And he goes, holy crap, guys, come look at this. You're gonna love this. Look at this guy. <laughs> oh, and geez. we're standing there and all of a sudden yeah the smell hit us we all just recoiled and backed up about 10 feet but he was all into it he wanted to he wanted to check it out and figure out how this guy died and yikes so we uh there was a few a few things like that that we i don't know you know as a fighter pilot we we sort of live a uh or a pilot in general you kind of live a isolated lifestyle yeah. from the, the destruction that you're causing down below you you launch your missile it goes a few miles and it blows up. There's no sound. There's no real impact or anything like that. You you know what you did, but you don't really get to see the results of it up close. So for us, a bunch of A-10 guys wandering around this literal battlefield, it was it was really shocking. It was um, it was uh, something that again will stick with me. It stuck with me for the rest of my time in the A-10. That hey, this is. You know, when I push this button, there's some there's some real implications for for people. And uh, so I, I never never did take it lightly and I took it even less lightly, um, you know, after that. I can only imagine what that must've been like, mm. you know, cause you're seeing, and I'm sure you're seeing bullet holes that fairly closely match the Gal 8 gun. We, we did see a yeah. tank that was sitting along the road. Um, not, not at this location, but, but previously in the day we stopped. It was one of the first tanks we had encountered and we said, I wonder what killed this tank. And the army guy, jumped up he goes hey look at this we came over and there's one hole in this tank just almost exactly 30 millimeters in size he said i imagine think this was an a10 so imagine that there you go <laughs> so the war wraps up you go back to england mm. and uh that you know and i got to tell all of our listeners when the a10s deploy we're down low we're going slow because you can't go very fast. And particularly, <laughs> I'm sure on your deployment down, you're all loaded out, aren't you? Because you don't know what you're going into. We had two big tanks, uh, fuel tanks going down uh, along with our- Oh, I forgot about those. Electronic yeah. countermeasures pod. I think we only had one going home because we realized we could do it without, just, just had to yeah. refuel a little more, but thank God for the tanker support. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, that was our job. And, uh, you know, I was going west. Everybody else was going east. Mm. I was stationed at Kadena at the time. Valerie was pregnant with Ryan, mm. my oldest mm. boy. Our daughter, Rachel, was born at Pease before we left. So I actually got to come home on the 1st of February. So I didn't fly through the whole war. Of course, when you get home, everybody wants to ask you questions <laughs> about this and that and the other. Two thirds of the questions you can't answer because yeah. of classification, you know. But we stopped in Utapau or Utapau, Thailand which mm. was wonderful, it was mm. a wonderful night there to relax. And then the Kadena the next day, you got to stop at Siganella. Siganella. Uh, probably should have been for a little longer. Place. Oh, yeah. Man, yeah. I could find all kinds of things wrong with my airplane at Siganella. <laughs> <laughs> I think we just wanted to get home, home at this point. And yeah, uh, yeah that, that was interesting. The, uh, the, ride, the ride to our hotel uh, with an Italian driver probably the most dangerous part of our whole week. <laughs> <laughs> that was a little crazy. Having been to Italy many times, 
even with my wife and my son, I took my 15 year old son out of school and we homeschooled him in Europe for 80 days in 10 countries. Mm. And, and we literally went down the entire boot of Italy. We started in uh, uh, Vicenza, Venice, Florence, Rome, Rome, Naples, Naples, Pompeii, and then turned around, went back to Perugia, which is their chocolate capital for Easter and everything. And man, you are taking your life in your hands on the (laughs) Autostrada. Yep. On the Autostrada, man, (laughs) people are going by you twice the speed of sound. Uh, And the wrecks are spectacular. Yeah, uh, very much like Saudi, actually. Saudis have a <laughs> reckless disregard yeah, for, for their yeah. own lives, I think, when they're driving. It's it's amazing. Yeah. And the millions of Datsun King Cab trucks that they have. There. <laughs> yes. White and orange Datsun King Cab trucks. And the fact that they don't clean up after accidents. They just push the cars off to the side. And so you're, you're driving along and you think, oh, my gosh, there's an accident. Well, it's been there for months. Yeah. And, uh, yeah, you know. yeah, that's right. You get back to England and the base is closing. Yeah, we got You're word on the that, brack list. Yeah, they were they were uh, basically pulling a tens out of theater. Peace had started breaking out all over Europe, especially later that year when uh, Soviet Union dissolved. The wall had already come down in what eighty nine, and uh, yeah. so yeah, there was really no need for us in in Europe in Europe anymore. NATO was uh, released us, so our squadron and the other a ten squadrons in England were gradually dissolved over the course of the next year. And we were all sent to different assignments. And uh, yeah, I tried to uh, I tried to get an F-117 assignment. Less, I had 550 hours in the A-10, so I didn't have enough time to do that. So yeah. they said, hey, you want to go to Texas and fly a T-38? I said, yes, please. <laughs> and, uh, Absolutely. Yeah. So I did that and uh, went to Del Rio, Texas, by the sea, taught there for a couple of years, and then went to Randolph Air Force Base and uh, taught the schoolhouse there, taught people how to be instructors in the, in the, the T-38, which yeah. was a blast. Uh, got some unique opportunities to go fly with the Navy, got to, to fly a Hornet with the Navy on a little exchange deal that they had. So that was kind of fun. It wasn't a full tour, but it was, I basically, I, I made the mistake of letting my squadron commander know that I could write. He decided to get me in on this joint program where the eight, the Air Force and the Navy were, were both using the T-6 Texan II at this point for primary training. Mm-hmm. And they were starting to do it together at common yeah. bases. And yeah. they wanted to see how far they could take this concept. So, well, we yeah. can do primary training. Can we do advanced training? So they sent me off to the Navy to kind of watch and learn and and listen and write a report on joint training, the possibilities for joint training. So when when all of us got back from our, our little excursion with the Navy and the Navy guys got back from the Air Force, we all said the same thing. Not only no, but heck no. We, yeah. we really can't do it any further than primary. My yeah. brother-in-law went through Pensacola as oh. an Air Force guy. Oh. <clears throat> yeah. Went through Pensacola and then uh, went up to Vance, you know, to the T1s. And sure enough, you know, he had some trouble in a certain area. And when they went back and looked, okay, he came from this joint training thing. They found, Oh, he's got a hole right here that Uh, he hasn't been taught. No wonder he didn't do so well in this phase. uh, And so the showed him the air force way of doing things, I guess you could say. Yeah. And he made it through. He flew the KC-135 just like I did. Oh, wow. uh, Yeah. What was it like flying the Hornet? Uh, It was fun. I, I think it was not as much fun as, as the A-10. Uh, it had short legs. It could uh, could turn real nice. Got real real good uh, alpha uh, available to it, yeah. uh, high AOA potential, so you could really bend it around. But yeah, short legs. Um, I you know I flew the B model only, which was you know the the earlier yeah. legacy version. So yeah. it was fairly primitive, but it was it was fun. I I got to ride along and do some bombing and and do some air to air stuff and learn how the Navy does things, which is very different from the Air Force. Like they say, you know, the Air Force, you get a stack of manuals four feet high and it tells you how to do everything. The Navy has almost nothing. And they basically say, well, hey, if it's, you know, if it's not one of this list of 75 <laughs> things to never yeah. do with an airplane, then go ahead. Then that means works. you can do it. If it's not and in the it, manual, that means you can do it. <laughs> if it yeah. If it, if it doesn't work out for you, we'll make it 76 things that you shouldn't do with yeah. an airplane. We'll add you to yeah. the list. So did you get a cat in the trap? No, I didn't. I didn't. I was, I was at Fallon Naval Air Station the whole time. So landlocked and out in the desert. A very yeah, good I friend of mine sim. was an aggressor out there. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, uh, Pee Wee Winder. He flew as an aggressor in the Hornets out there, and he said Wait. that was one of the most. That was one of the funnest assignments he ever had. He just go out and fly air to yeah. air three times a, three times a day. Yeah. 
And the ranges are right there too. They're right nearby. Yeah, so yeah. yeah. So it doesn't matter that the jet has short legs because five miles off the end of the runway, you're on the range. Yeah. You know? Yeah, exactly. And, and exactly. Are, I am a very unusual tanker pilot. I have 10 cats and traps on eight aircraft carriers. I saw that. That's really cool. And, that is uh, amazing. One ride was actually in the S3 Viking, which was really huh. a lot of fun. Yeah. You know, most of it was in the back seat of the in the back of the cod. Right. Facing backwards. Facing backwards. Way. Yeah. Facing backwards. But Did that. Uh, my that's S3 fun. time was God, it was a lot of fun. <laughs> and that's a fully Neat. aerobatic airplane, too. Yeah. Like, that was the crazy thing. You know, the guy says, Okay, we're gonna go down now and tag ships. He just rolled the thing over on its back and split us. <laughs> yeah. Down to fifteen hundred feet. And I'm like, going, <laughs> wow, this is nuts. Uh, if I remember right, you've done some commercial bandit stuff also. Is that correct? Yeah. A lot of it is still a little close hold, so I I can't get into it too much, but um, I I have been flying Soviet uh, stuff for, um, geez, about upon 30 years now. I I got an opportunity early on to get involved with uh, flying with a private owner of a MiG-15. I flew the Hawker Hunter. Then I did some um, other stuff, but then in 99, uh, I encountered this company in Rockford, Illinois, which is where I live now, that was uh, putting together L-39s yeah. and various other things. Um, I got involved with that. I've been doing it for 22 years. I've been teaching in the L-39 and doing some other stuff uh, along with that. And we we do type ratings. We do upset training. You know, we do formation yeah. training if that's required. Yeah. We, we we do it all. We, yeah. we fly air shows at Oshkosh. We do yeah. And uh, it's been it's been a lot of fun. You know, those airplanes, the L-39s are great. They're really wonderful jets. And it sort of keeps me in the game, lets me pull Gs. My yeah. other job that I had for a while, I had it actually for eight years. I was doing some contract adversary air. We're not quite to the point where I can tell I you all that. about it. All I can really say is that I did it. <laughs> and uh, hopefully very soon, I'll be able to tell you the full story. I think that's coming. Uh, that was very interesting also, although... I got to say a lot of that stuff that I did was pretty sketchy. Some of the organizations and companies that were involved, (laughs) minimal budgets and uh, a little scary, Yeah, but, uh, but still fun and unique. I've enjoyed that. And then I've also been flying, you know, for the airlines. So I've been doing that for 26 years. That's been very rewarding as well. I fly the Airbus A320 as a captain and, uh, Flying just domestic stuff. Again, lots of fun. So I, I fly all day, every day, and that's kind of all I do. <laughs> fly airplanes and think about Sounds it. Sounds like a great life. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well. So I'll ask you the same thing I asked a friend of mine who flies for one of the big majors, and he went from Boeing equipment to Airbus equipment. How long did it take you to get used to the side stick? About 20 minutes in the first sim. The first simulator session, you know, I'd already flown the plane from the right seat for a few yeah. years. Now I went back to the left and yeah. it, it was a little odd. I guess my first time doing an approach, I was thinking, I you just have to flip your brain around. I know the first sim I was, I was flying an approach and I uh, getting a little bit below the glide slope. So I pulled back with my right hand, but that was a throttle. That wasn't the right thing to do. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, geez, it's my left hand. Okay. And after that, no problem whatsoever. It's a, yeah. it's an easy transition and a great airplane to fly. It's way bigger than a 737 cockpit. It's got a tray table, a side stick, flies great, flies like an airplane, really comfortable, good air conditioning. I mean, what more do you want? I got to, during the, the tanker competition, I got to fly I was down in Melbourne, Florida, and I got to fly hmm. the A330. Oh, neat. Tanker. Okay. Cool. It took me about two minutes to get hmm. used to flying with that side stick. Hmm. I was at Nellis. You're we were a better pilot than me. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> uh, it, we were flying in and out of Nellis, you know. It was someplace I'd known because being in the weapons school, the tanker weapons school, standing up the tanker weapons school, I'd been there a lot. I'll never forget flying my first approach going, okay, well, let's see what this is like. And I'm like going, you know what? This isn't bad. You know, it's a little more sensitive than I thought it was, but it wasn't bad. And after a couple of minutes, I did a go around out of that and came back around the pattern. I'm like, this is actually pretty easy to do. You know, (laughs) it was, it was weird having it in my left hand instead of my right hand, like a normal stick, Mm. but still it was an easy transition for me. The airplane flew fantastic. The engines on the airplane were great. You know, the three thirties got 
you know, a lot of gobs of power. Yeah. You know, and it was just, it was just a fun airplane to fly. Cool. So Glad you got a chance to do that. So you work with pig. Yeah. Yeah. Pig came to work. Uh, he, he'd been doing flying uh, L 39s for many years uh, yeah. uh, on his own, kind of with his, his own operation. He had his, his own L 39 uh, for a long yeah. time. Uh, he sold that and we hired him on a few years ago as an instructor. So he's doing, you know, instruction for us part-time and uh, a great guy. Gig. Yeah. Yeah. It's still yeah. also flying at United as well. So, yeah. So talk to, tell our audience what you do in this syllabus and the L39, particularly upset training, because this is very fascinating mm. what you guys do. And you found a really good niche thing to do that really can save a pilot's life. If you um, fly a high performance airplane and especially a jet airplane, and that's really who we gear it towards. I mean, anybody could take the course, but as you know, uh, and, and your listeners will learn who don't know, jet airplanes, you can get yourself into an unusual attitude without any kind of external uh, cues that, that, that it's happening. Uh, you point an airplane down or let's, let's say you overbank. You're just flying along straight and level and you inadvertently put in an aileron actuation that you're not aware of. Maybe you're looking down at your knee at an approach plate or something or you're distracted by a radio or whatever. You put a little input in, you start a roll. Well, you don't feel that roll necessarily because it's below the threshold of your inner ear to catch yeah. it. But the plane's vector, uh, lift vector now changes. And if you continue to roll, the plane will start to descend. And if you continue to roll even more, it'll descend even faster. And I, this is how I set it up for the first time. I'll uh, basically have them close their eyes and I'll do a sub threshold roll, I call it, where I just put in input very slowly, let the nose fall. And then I give it to them at 90 degrees of bank and about 40 to 45 degrees nose low. And the G has not changed. The sound of the engine has not changed. The wind noise has not changed. Oh. You are just sitting there at 1G, fat, dumb, and happy, and they look up and go, huh? Ah. <laughs> so that's a nose low recovery, and uh, you're descending at about eight to 10,000 feet a minute, and uh, that's where they go, ah, okay, I understand. So, yes, we do upset training for corporate pilots or anybody that wants to do it in a jet. Yeah. And uh, we give them all kinds of different realistic scenarios. We do awake turbulence upsets, do some kind of upsets that simulate an autopilot input that was not de not desired, yeah. like a pitch up or yeah. sudden pitch up. Yeah. Um, do aerobatics, a little bit of basic aerobatics with them, so that, you know get the confidence of doing a roll and and things like that. So uh, it's a either a two or a four ride syllabus. You can do either one. Depends on how deep into it you want to get. If we do the yeah. four ride one, the fourth ride is a is really an eye opener because we'll we'll put you vertical in both directions, you know, up and down, <laughs> uh, and it's a little bit higher G, but but it's still we try to simulate a corporate or or biz jet environment. So we try yeah. not to pull more than about two and a half G's for our recoveries. Yeah, and we try to make it sort of just a a mechanical thing to recover if you're nose high versus nose low. And uh, it's, it's really fun. I, I enjoy teaching it and people enjoy taking it. They're a little, a lot of people who've never done it, they're a little bit nervous at first about it, but they, yeah. they figure out, you know what? I can control this airplane from any attitude and it's not a problem. Yeah, I'm upside down, but the plane's got enough control to get me back upright again and it, it's fine. Well, so, and uh, you know, you and I, through our whole entire Air Force careers, particularly in pilot training, we're used to being upside down. Mm-hmm. And this is one of the first things they taught us was unusual, uh, as we used to say, unusable attitudes, <laughs> abusable you know? attitudes, unusable attitudes. All right. <laughs> we used to do this in the simulator on our check rides in the KC 135. It was part of the check ride. You had to mm. show the, the check pilot that even as a co-pilot, you knew how to get the tanker out of an unusable attitude. And uh, it was always, you know, usually roll wings level and pull. And we can only pull, you know, less than two G's, but still mm. we had to do that. I know a lot of my private pilot friends who have never been mm. in an unusual attitude. Yeah. And they're not taught how to do that until they come to a program like yours. And that's why I think your program is so significant mm. and not for just jet pilots, like you say, but other pilots to learn how do you get an airplane out of a bad attitude? And remember the first little airplane that we flew in pilot training, brother, 
T-37. Tweet. What did they, they, they do with us? Yeah. They put us in spins. They put us in spins. And that was a, that was a challenging maneuver because there were four different varieties of spins. And you yeah. also had to do the spin recovery exactly precisely, or it was not going to recover. You had to do that pull bold face procedure. Perfect. All 43 words. Exactly <laughs> yeah. In the right order. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But again, it got to the point where you could do that. That's so critical. I think anybody who's in in pilot training of, uh, you know, a private pilot training course should ask to go out. And if your instructor doesn't want to do it, find somebody who will or yeah. find somebody who has a plane who can do it and go do it. The Citabria yeah. or some kind of similar airplane that you can really throw it around and go out and, and experience that before you get too deep into training, because it's it's a big confidence builder and it's critical for for flight safety, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and I think that's the big reason, too, is flight safety, because there have been a lot of people who have been in those in upset maneuvers like that and had no idea how to get out. Yeah. No yeah. idea. Or, you know, you know or if you're in the final turn and, you, and you, uh, you're and you in the base turn or something and you get yourself in one of these classic cross-control stalls, well, yeah. if you've had a little bit of aerobatic training, you might detect that buffet a little bit earlier and yeah. put in a put in the spin recovery or prevention mm -hmm. controls a little quicker and maybe save your life. Yep. So I remember one time out in the area stalling a T-38 mm. and how it scared the <sighs> crap out of me feeling the, feeling the, the elephants on the wings and everything. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wasn't watching what I was doing. I was too mm. slow coming over the top. Mm. And I remember rolling wings level <laughs> and the airplane just started going, <laughs> you know, and I'm like, <laughs> Uh huh. And I got on the ground. I told my instructor, I said, I said, uh, I did something stupid today and here's what it is. Hmm. He didn't bust me on the ride, you know, cause he wasn't out there, but he just said, he said, well, good. Then you learned something today. I said, yeah, there you go. Don't stall a T-38. Uh, unfortunately, a couple of weeks later, we had a student and instructor coming back doing a circling approach, stalled the airplane, killed both of them. Oh, geez. Just a couple of weeks later. No kidding. Hmm. Yeah. Coming in, uh, doing a circling maneuver and the, and the instructor was flying the airplane too. He was making all the radio calls. Boy. Installed mm. it. Final turn stall. Classic final turn stall. Put there is an the unforgiving cabinet. airplane. That was a very unforgiving airplane. You know, out of all the airplanes that I got to fly, and I always wanted to fly a 707 when I was a kid. Mm. The T-38 was probably one of the funnest airplanes to fly. Oh, absolutely. Particularly in formation, Buck. Yep. Yep. Wonderful Partic airplane for formation. Oh, my gosh. I'll never forget flying in formation in Oklahoma at Vance hmm. after a thunderstorm had gone through. And my instructor in the back seat was saying, look, you can see his stick inputs by the way the ribbons are coming off the wingtips, mm -hmm. the condensation ribbons and everything. And hmm. it's one of those things that you, I see in my mind. I can bring it back in an instant and think to myself, that was one of those great days to fly. Yes. Great days yes. to fly. And brother, you've had a lot of great days to fly. I have yeah. been very fortunate, um, blessed. And uh, sometimes I just, um, I can't believe what I've been able to do. And I, I hope to continue doing it. It's just great. Like Aviation we always say, so vast, so vast, so many things to do. You know, I, I love the the title of Jimmy Doolittle's book. I could never be so could lucky never be again. So lucky again. Yep. And that's, that's exactly I, right. I could never I'm be that lucky again. I, I would hope that the, the opportunities are, continue for people who are just starting now that to be able to fly. And there's all kinds of cool stuff out now, you know, not just the military, but, yeah. but there's just some neat stuff coming up. There's, there's possibility of electric light airplanes. There's, you know, just, just neat stuff coming up. So some I think it's a great technology. time to be getting into aviation. Well, and I tell everybody in my audience, there is no better time than right now to become a pilot because yeah. <laughs> the airlines are hurting for pilots. The military is hurting for pilots. There's no better time in the history of the planet when yep. more pilots are needed than right now. That is and right. That's what I would admonish all my folks. Well, Buck, it's been great to have you on. Okay, brother. Thank Thanks you. for coming on Lessons from the Cockpit uh, show today. And folks, I can't... It, express how cool his book is hogs in the sand go out and get this book because it really gives you a behind the scenes look on how this airplane flies 
but more importantly, how it's employed and some great stories about being out in the desert, hunting bad guys with this and uh, some pretty comical stories too. Thanks for being Thanks, on, Mark. Mark. Hey, we really appreciate it. If anybody wants any inf- further information about it, you can go to hogsinthesand.com or you can join us on Facebook at Hogs in the Sand. And we got a bunch of extra stuff that's not in the book there that we'll continue to add as time goes on. So thanks, Mark. Really great uh, talking to you today. Great talking to you too. To all of our listeners out there, there is one airplane that anyone on the ground wants to hear overhead. And that's the sound of the A-10 Warthog. But more importantly, that gun. Because it goes brrrt. It makes a very unique sound, which I've put in the show notes so that you can see some of the things that the hog does. But more importantly, what does it sound like? Because this is a very unique sound that comes out of this gun. Included in the show notes is also a link to wall pilot and a print that you can stick on your wall of the A-10. Wall Pilot creates custom aviation art for the walls of your home, office, or hangar. They're printed on vinyl. They're extremely detailed. You can peel them off and stick them to any flat surface, like I said, home, office, or hangar. We've done a 30-footer for a former TWA pilot. Thanks for tuning in and listening today to Buck Windham and his stories about flying the A-10 in the first Gulf War. Please share this episode and other previous episodes, which can be found on my website at marcusera.com under the podcast pull down box. And by all means, folks, you've got to read Buck's book, Hogs in the Sand, the sponsor for this episode. Hogs in the Sand gives you a great behind the scenes look and an in the cockpit view of what it's like flying combat missions in this extremely recognizable airplane not only visually, but because of the sound it makes. There's some great stories, not only in the first Gulf War, but the second Gulf War and in Afghanistan, what the hog can do for those that are troops in contact on the ground. Folks, we really appreciate you being here with us on the Lessons from the Cockpit Show. I'm working on something very unique and very special. I'm working on a six to seven part series about one 17 hour battle that hopefully by the middle of June, we'll start producing those episodes. There's two more people I have to interview that have an incredible story about this particular battle. And I think all of you are really gonna wanna hear this because two of the guys I interviewed got shot down during this particular battle. Thanks for tuning into the show today. I hope all of you have enjoyed this episode and you can go and listen to other episodes from my website at marcusera.com. Look forward to talking to you next week on the Lessons from the Cockpit show.